Hello! Welcome to Free Will, Science, and Religion. I'm Chandler Klebs, and I'm here with George Ortega, David Joseph, WSD Time, and Jamie Soden. And today we're going to be talking a little bit about the Venus Project and what it is specifically. Um, Jamie has been into it a lot recently. He and David Joseph and I have watched videos and stuff on it, um, but we've never really talked about it that much in a podcast, just a passing mention. So, Jamie, if somebody, if you were to try to explain what the Venus Project is, how would you explain it? Um, how would I explain it is uh, it's a new society movement where um, they eliminate um, trade, money, and all that kind of thing, and they replace it with um, a so-called resource-based economy. Now, what this is is that they analyze um, the maximum amount of resources that are available on our planet. Um, you know, they do a, they said they're going to do a survey or whatever, and uh, everything that they do will be based on the carrying capacity of our planet. So, um, what resources we, you know, what what we get is what we get. If there's not enough, like, of one type of resource, they'll look for an alternative. But if it works. Um, they say that this kind of society can make a much more sane, a much happier, a much more um, fairer, you know, a society. And they say that using this, they can eliminate poverty um, and most crimes, war, and that type of thing. Yeah, I am with that a hundred percent. Yeah, I would just add that um, it's, it's kind of like using the scientific method for social concern to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. exactly. Right. So, what what are some of the implications? Like, for example, is there one salary that everyone across the world receives, or, or actually, there's no money? So, like, in terms of like allocating resources, everybody gets, you know, simply according to their needs, just um, you know, uh, based on on available resources. And this this and Jamie, this applies, I guess, to everything, to personal needs and all. Yeah, of course it does. Yeah, it will it will apply to your medical needs, your educational needs. I mean, um, what you need will be provided for you, either by automation, or by, you know, people who are trained in a certain scientific field, like uh, medic, you know, scientists who work in uh, brain surgery or whatever. And uh, it will be about using the scientific method to improve our standard of living, and your incentive to better yourself and, and to make society better for everyone else would be based on ethics and challenges. That's what I said. Right, and I guess what, you, what you're getting at, George, is, is the idea of, say, um, if everybody wants a brand new car, how is that going to work? Or would that uh, be... Yeah, David, that's, that's one question, sure. Yeah. Right, right. And, and, and the answer to that is... Um, Something along the lines of, um, if you live in a, in a suburban area and um, say it's summertime and uh, you see people mowing their lawn, but how many how many times do you see everyone mowing their lawn at the same time? And yet every single one of them owns a lawnmower. So in a resource-based economy, you wouldn't need to own a lawnmower. You would simply go get a lawnmower whenever you wanted it. That's a great point. That's a great point. So basically, it's like the public library system, where people exactly yeah. yeah they get to check out books for free and then they return them, and so because not everybody needs to be reading that book at the same time, and so just like the lawnmower example David Joseph gave, that would work. I like the idea. Well, yeah, and uh, there'll be little waste as well because um, anytime something was outdated, they'll update it. They'll um... Uh, take the same uh, basic design of something else and then update it like with newer technologies, if you get what I mean. All right, so under the current system in general, you know, a personal initiative is, is rewarded by increased income. You know, so like, mm. so I imagine, you know, like I can't envision a world where everything is not automated. You know, there's going to have to be services naturally, you know, medical services and things. So exactly. um, Sorry, the, the question becomes, um, 
Are, are you guys familiar with research or just like an investigation or exploration of what will replace this kind of like this gain that the people, in other words, sometimes like um, our current system drives ambition, you know, people work hard, you know, for their personal benefit, but in a way that benefits everyone. So the question would become, and this is, I think, one of the, one of the, um, one of the points that I think people would be most need to be comfortable about is like, um, is there evidence that people like under a system like this would just work as hard as we need to be? Because who knows? Maybe, maybe under our current system, maybe people are working too hard. Mm. Right. Right. Well, mm. what it will come from. Uh... We'll put it this way, George. The, the money incentive system that's driven by money and trade, it's conditioned thinking. The reason why people are incentivized to work hard, to save up you know, for whatever they want and need, is because they were conditioned uh, by governments or parents, whatever, to... you know, Mainly parents. Yeah. But if they were taught um, a new incentive system, you know, like based on ethics and self-challenge then wouldn't that um, be effective would that re wouldn't it replace capitalism completely I think you're right Jamie I think you you know just by your understanding that, that the way we are is conditioned we are conditioned to kind of like work harder so we'll get more than the next person so we'll feel better than the next person and stuff so like yeah I don't think it has to be that way mm -hmm. yeah because some people um, they worked hard because um, they liked making new discoveries. I mean, Albert Einstein, he enjoyed his job as a scientist, didn't he, sir? Right, and I would also say, you know, well, why do you do this this podcast, George? You know, what, what's your motivation for doing the podcast? Right, and and so yeah, but uh, and and you're right. I think I think maybe we we in general, you know, serve as as kind of like an example of how it could be and should be. I mean, we the thing is, we are kind of like the exception. You know, we, most people I don't think are like us, but actually the Internet is changing that. I mean, think of all the material that not just us, but so many people put out there for free, the, the, the software and everything. So I, right. think, I think, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. it's not for profit stuff is uh, in itself an incentive theme because we're we're incentivized to, uh, you know, better society with this um, no free will message. And we're not getting paid for this, so. Yeah, I think yeah. there are many examples to point to where somebody has some passion, some kind of cause they want to promote. And so, you know, they might write uh, blog posts or books or record podcasts or, or, or make open source software or whatever the case may be. There are all kinds of examples of things that people work hard on, even though they're not being paid any money. And so that says something about the conditioning of those people and what they're motivated. You mean open source software like uh, what Oracle like make? You know, op Open Office. Um, I believe that was uh, made by Oracle, wasn't it? Um, right. Yeah, and and like that pretty much has made uh, Microsoft Word obsolete. <laughs> <laughs> because it's free. <laughs> That's what I use for all my books. Some people prefer Linux as well. Oh, yeah. Well, that's another advantage of this kind of like, um, it's got to be kind of like a, a centrally organized or governed system, you know, governed by reason and, and, and logic rather than ambition and, and greed and all. Um, under our current system, you might have like 10 different companies working on, let's say, some kind of a software, you know, word processor and stuff. And there's there's a vast repetition of effort. There's a, it's it's it seems like to a great extent it's it's highly inefficient. You know, just having all these people competing on the same things. Whereas if they were cooperating, let's say, sharing their information instead of like keeping it proprietary and keeping it from others, you know, in this competitive mode. You know, we'd be able to get so much more done, so much more efficiently. Exactly. If everyone was mm -hmm. just working as a team on something, then you would just have these products that were the result of all these people working on it, rather than having com competitive, similar products by different companies. And then customers are confused, wondering, well, which do I use? Yeah, I think another aspect of our system is that. Um, 
it encourages overproduction. A, a person who wants to make money, they will kind of like create a need for their product, you know, through advertising in consumers. And I mean, like, and they will just like, you know, try to create as great a need as, as possible. And some of these, some of the things that we, we buy just aren't really necessary. Um, whereas in, in a system that's, that's more, you know, scientifically needs based, um, you don't have us wanting things that we wouldn't otherwise want. Yeah, I mean, what the Venus Project is about, I mean, at the core of it, they want to provide everyone with their basic needs. That includes, you know, non-contaminated food, clean water, safe shelter, etc. And with all this, you have security, don't you? You don't have to worry about anything, do you? Yeah. Um, now, it's some some people will claim that this is like socialism and communism, and like, I mean, anything that's socialist, I think a lot of people will claim it's communist. But I think the the major difference between I think what we're talking about is like, for example, the the, the communist country in, in other words, the, the rich in capitalism were replaced by like the party elite in communism. Like whether it was like the USSR or China. You had certain people that were in the party that, you know, they basically were given special privileges. So I, I think it's important to, to, to point out that a system like this does not have to be communist, does not have to be militaristic, because that was another part of communism, just like, you know, just, you know, um, expand influence through militarization and all. Um, again, people, what, what are other concerns that people have, like, with a, with a system like this? Hmm. Well, like you said, George, people would still have to do some kind of work, like, even under a system like this. Um, but yeah. yeah, because being based on a scientific method, people will have to make new discoveries in order to prevent future disasters. Like, they'll have to make, for example, physicists will have to make calculations to judge whether or not um, the, there's a likelihood that an asteroid will hit it within a lifetime or sometime in the near future because th this kind of stuff is very important yeah. oh and just just climate change alone is, is like a vast challenge exactly so people i mean you have to tell people they can't just and that's laugh. another thing well go ahead sorry yeah so you have to tell people even under a system like this you can't you have to tell people they can't just sit on their asses and do nothing otherwise things will just collapse you have to tell them that they still need to challenge themselves in order to maintain that paradise that people want. Yeah. Right, so we, we would have to maintain some kind of a criminal justice system, mm -hmm. I guess, like, like exactly. if a person is able to work, they can't yep. just say, like, no, I'm not going to work, right? Well, well, I, I think they can, because, um, I mean, if you take, like, today's... Depends, uh, yeah, it depends on who it is. Right. Who your person, this person is, yeah. Yeah. Sure, you may have to do some work because if you got your own house, you may have to maintain it yourself. Or, yeah, yeah. But if you got some kind of special talent, like if you're if you're very smart and you've got very good critical thinking skills, you might be asked to, you know, go to university and you know help the scientists figure certain things out. You know. Sure. But yeah. I think the idea is that. Um... If, if you take today's system and all, all the factors that are against people doing something <clears throat> to help others, we, me. we live in a very selfish system, and yet we have quite a lot of people who volunteer their time and do things to kind of further social well-being, like, like we try to do, I guess. And so in a system that provides for your healthcare needs and, you know, your living needs and, yeah. you know, increases your standard of living, I think in that kind of a system, you'd see a big increase in people who are willing to actually, you know, get their hands dirty, so to speak, and actually help out a bit more. Yeah, because there'll be less depressed people. Because if if, if there's like a, a good healthcare and educational system, then this means that this applies to mental health as well. Um, so people have, um, how can I put this? I mean, depressed people can see counselors more often. They wouldn't have to pay to see a doctor, would they? So, right. You know. Right, but how to like, let's, let's say like, so we will have to kind of like impose like some kinds of like threats or punishments or penalties on people who can work and won't because no. I mean, other, other, 
All right, because like, explain to me how that would work. Because like, what one concern that I'm having is that like the people who are working might feel resentful that let's say someone says they don't don't want to work and they would still receive the the same amount of resources. Right, but that's because we live in a system that's based a large part on scarcity. So everyone's working to kind of get their share. But in a system that gives things away without a price tag, you, you haven't got that kind of neurosis going on inside people's heads. So you might get you might get someone that, that is thinking along the lines of, you know, why should I work if if that guy isn't working? That mentality, that mentality, I uh, can't speak at the moment, that mentality isn't actually, that that isn't conducive to the natural or resource-based economy. So, so they're kind of already off the chart, so to speak, at that point. What I would to, say yes. about that is if there are those people with those attitude that they, uh, that they don't want to work and or that they start, or there's people who are working and resenting people who aren't working. I feel feel like that attitude shows there's something wrong with them, and such that well, they're not truly motivated to do whatever that thing is, and perhaps they need to be given a different task that they actually are passionate about. So that so one to where they don't they don't care about comparing themselves to others and how much they're. Exactly. Yeah. Right, and you have to keep in mind that, that the idea is to automate everything as much as possible. So basically any manual labor task can be automated by today's technology. So that, that's not much of a problem. So you're just left with the, the more creative jobs. So people kind of tend to enjoy doing them a lot more. Yeah, things that interest and challenge them. That's what they um, said in their Chaucer's Hours documentary, I believe. Or was, or was it in their Paradise or Oblivion documentary? I can't remember, I'll have to go back and check. But I agree with George Ortega's points about a criminal justice system. In terms of that, yes, we will need like um, punishments and... You know. uh, I, I, don't, I don't think the idea is to have punishments. The idea is to, to kind of just, almost like, a, like a, uh, a mental health hospital or something like that. You know, if someone does something wrong or something harmful, then they're kept there in order to protect the rest of society. Oh, I said, but they're not punished. They're they're helped. I think I get what Jeff Frisco is saying when he says we we'll yeah. don't have any prisons. I think what he means by that, and I hope this, I hope he means this, is that we will have mental hospitals to keep um, dangerous people locked up, like away from society, so they can't hurt anyone else, but not necessarily punishing them. Is that, is that what you mean? Right, exactly, exactly. I mean, you could say it's punishment to take away someone's freedom, but yeah, that that's kind of necessary to protect society. So yeah, yeah. And you have to tell people they can't just go out doing whatever they want because if they do this, such and such, then we'll yeah. we'll have to remove them from society. Right, right. It's like um, it's like in Norway they have that that prison in on the island. I think it's Bastoy Prison or something like that. And the reoffending rate is so low, and it's just like an open prison for, for murderers and rapists, and it works really well. Yeah, I mean, if it if, if it works, if, if converting all prisons into mental hospitals uh, proves itself to be more effective at the lowering crime rates than everything else, then I'll be all for it. You know, that means we won't need things like, you know, death penalty. Not that I'd support the death penalty anyway, but it would just prove we won't need it. All right, so like like a lot of good ideas, um, I think the um, the group of people that are most against it would be like the top one percent, the very rich that just have so much. Oh yeah, definitely, more. they'll definitely be against it. Right. So then the question becomes, what strategies would we consider are, you know, moral or are necessary? to be able to kind of like expedite this on, and just to, to overcome that influence. Oh, um, what the very rich um, having this much power to the point where it's harder to change society's values. Is that what well, yeah, Jamie, like to, to, in other words, like while many people would be in favor of a, of a world like this, the top 1% would be extremely against it and so then, you know, so that's the battle. That's part of the battle. You know, how, what, what is needed to kind of like 
to either disempower them or convince them that it's in their best interest. Well, it's like Jet Frosco and Roxanne Meadows said, you have to you have to show them the advantages of this new system. If, if they see the advantages, and if they see that they will have a you know, higher living standard that they currently do now, then they might accept it because Jet Frisco reckons that under this new system, the people living under that system will be living better than the wealthiest person today due to the overall better living standards, you know, like um, better cancer treatments and whatever, you know. Right, and, and you have to take into account that it would be a safer world for them as well. I mean, if you're a billionaire going around in a world full of poverty, yeah. then how, how long are you going to how long are you going to be safe for, to be honest? Yeah, you know? exactly. yeah that's what I'm worried. It's only a matter of time, yeah. Yeah, if, you, if, you go, if, you're, a, if you're a billionaire and you go into a place like Iran, it's, uh, it's very risky. You're, you're walking into a lion's den, and uh, there's only a matter of time before you, you know, get beaten killed or whatever like by these uh, terrorists you know? well when people get desperate they'll come to take your stuff you know so yep yeah. so does fresco have a timeline and like uh, that he expects that this could be done um you know how is this years decades how how long does he think does he think it'll take to to just transform our, our collective psychology into like a, a civilization that will appreciate and and really want this yeah. Also, you have to take into account, George, that Jet Fresco promoted the same sort of thing you're promoting. He talked to, um, about the issue of free will as well, how our environment shapes our behavior. He promotes everything you've talked about in your podcast and your Manhattan show. Right? He does. He does bring it up that our our behavior is deterministic. That we're, you know, every, our behavior, our thoughts, our feelings. Every word we speak, it's all causal. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, that that'll create a much much more peaceful world. You know, more compassion. Yeah, well, with regards to the time frame, um, it, I've heard it said that if everyone was on board, then it could be just a couple of decades to completely transform the Earth. But I'm I'm skeptical. I don't know about that. I mean, I do. When it yeah. comes to economics, I do agree with Venus Project. But when it comes to things like the criminal justice system and energy, I'm not 100 percent sure because they talked about using thorium as a, a source of energy. The problem with this is that nuclear power requires cooling, and if the cooling system fails, then you have a meltdown, and that's where the problem lies. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. I don't think the future really is nuclear power. I mean, they could try it, but I'm a bit worried about it. That's all I want to say. And you were saying before that, like, the they, the rich, the very rich, have to be shown how it works. Like, for example, in that Scandinavian prison you, you mentioned, that it's not like a prison that you know recidivism is so much less. Um, what would this look like? I mean, like creating, for example, cities that, that, that operate under this kind of like scenario and just like to show the rest of the world that it's possible? That, that's the idea. The plan is to kind of create a test city just to show people that, hey, this can be done and this is the result of when we do this. So it would act as just like an example for people to come and take a look at. And if they wanted to, then they could get on board and replicate it, basically. Actually, they mentioned this in um, one of their Twitter feeds, uh, I believe. Um, they said that they're going to do a test city real soon and see how practical a Venus project really is. You know, like build their self-contained, you know, university um, research center and resident residential area and entertainment areas. Like they, they they got everything that we enjoy, every every convenience that we've got, everything from medical care to entertainment it's all going to be you know in their round city you know round shaped city wherever and it's all going to be constructed with automation they're going to try it in a test city somewhere right because it would be difficult in the united states because like mm. you know a city would still have to like be under the state and federal laws yeah that. yeah that's gonna be i was kind of thinking that myself that's gonna screw things up a bit unless they can get the 
permission to build this kind of city. It's, you know. Well, it just doesn't. It doesn't have to be in the United States. You know, there's no reason why. You know, I mean, if there's other countries where where you know it, it's like. You know, let's say the federal and state governments or regional governments there would just be more, much more amenable. You well, know, just give give these cities complete autonomy. Well, they could try it in Europe, I suppose. I mean, there's no reason why that couldn't happen, is there, David? Um, I don't know to be honest. I've I've heard rumours of, of a test city coming about yeah. for for quite a few years now. So yeah. I think just wait and see on that one. Yeah, I mean. Europe, um, they're quite known for um, using al alternate methods of rehabilitating criminals and stuff, and uh, it seems to be working for them. Yeah. All right. So, how does like the the government under this kind of like system work? In other words, like our current systems tend to be. I mean, they're supposed to be democratic. You know, the rich have way too much control, but um, but how? Who would decide? Um, you know who who runs things, who makes the decisions. How how, how does that work? It wouldn't be a who; it'd be more of a how. So, in, instead yeah. of people's opinions, it would be a case of using the scientific method to come to a conclusion. Yeah, there'll be it will all be based on data, George. Like okay, they'll, they'll go based on what nature tells them, not what not what they want to be true. Right, but like for example, like with this, yeah. Um, all right, yeah, I, I, I um, definitely there are ways of kind of like establishing um, what what works better. But it, it seems like in some instances, like you know, that it would be possible to kind of like to make that prediction because let's say the system hasn't been created yet, so it, it would be kind of people guessing. You know, sure using using kind of criteria, evidence to guess, but you, you might have like different competing um, proposals. Like even for example, the proposal, let's say there's two competing places that, that might be best for, to, to act as the city, as the first city, you know? So you've got one group that wants one city, another group that wants a different city. You know, um, I'm wondering if, if Fresco or, you know, uh, the other Venus project, people have just, you know, explored that, that governing aspect more. Um, David, do you have an answer for that? Um, I, I would say that there would always be something that would, would, that would make it either one place or the other. I, I don't think it'd be a case of two places being exactly the same. I think there'd be some kind of difference that that kind of pushed them either towards one location over the other. Right, but for example, let's say one is like by um, a um, an ocean. One's on, on the, the seashore and all that's advantageous for various reasons. Um, but it happens to be, let's say, let's say it's the west coast of California or whatever. Just it would be like close to some fault lines for some like earthquakes and stuff. Whereas like another place wouldn't have the advantage of, you know, the ocean there. But it wouldn't have the the the, the danger of, of this you know the, these earthquakes. So like you know it seems like you know yes a lot of things can be um, determined scientifically empirically and stuff. But it seems like there's always going to be some kinds of like you know judgment calls predictions that 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 maybe nobody knows what's best and you know you just have to go with with what makes sense. That's that's a lot of in a lot of ways that's how democracy works. You know, we, we just don't know whether something will work until we try it. Right, right. Yeah, they, they have talked about a system where basically everyone get, gets to vote, but um, it's a case of being educated enough as well. That's the idea, is to have people educated to the point where they actually know what they're voting for, you know, that they're aware of all the implications and they get all the information they need to make an informed vote on what they want. And also, it's not going to be achieved through war and violence. It's going to be achieved through um, civilized discussion. Um, Jack Fresco and Roxanne Meadows, they've already made it clear that nothing in their um, manifesto or whatever involves, um, you know, force. You know, they're, not, no, no, they're not trying to force it onto people. If they want it, they can join. If they don't want it, they don't, they don't have to join. They can opt out. So...
I mean, so here's here's just a thought. I've been listening to you guys, and well, imagine this. Imagine that um, because not everybody's going to be down with a resource based economy. What if there there are some people who are able to start up s such a city and eventually even a small country based on this system, and then over time they'll be living that way, whereas the rest of the world will be living a. a the way things have been for the longest time and then people eventually compare people eventually see well you know th these people with this resource-based economy who shares everything they have a lower crime rate than the rest of the world and then that will be what finally convinces the rest of the world that it's a good idea right right and uh, I mean oh. I, I, would, I would say to George's point as well I mean you, you, you bring up like um it's almost like a technical problem that needs a technical solution. It's not like a, um, a political problem or a financial problem. You know, you're either solving the problem of not being close to the, to the ocean or you're solving the problem of being in a location that is prone to earthquakes. Right. Well, I mean, it, and it also depends on, like, the, the kind of democratic system. For example, um, like with healthcare, like, you know, our medical decisions probably wouldn't be in the hands of the general public because I think you need very special expertise in medicine to, to determine, you know, what kinds of procedures are best for what kinds of, you know, situations and all. So, I mean, would it be kind of like a representative democracy? I mean, um, you, you see my point? Because like sometimes, like, you know, even like, um, the, the, the benefits of being by the sea versus being by a place that doesn't have the risk of, of earthquakes. For a lot of people, you know, there, there might be so many factors to consider that one, one might need to be an expert in, in making these kinds of decisions. So, like, it doesn't seem like, you know, putting it to a popular vote would, would be, you know, the, the, the wisest course, because then you have, like, a lot of people who are just, just ignorant about too many factors in it just making a decision so how how would um how would that work under under the, the venus project what you know what's what's the reliance on experts look, look like well um, go ahead jamie um they'll um have discussions on where where the best uh, places uh, for construction will be say where the crops should be where your um your houses should be etc and all that and ha they'll also factor in you know natural disasters um the likelihood of um of them um, you know happening in certain areas and they'll factor it into the construction and the design of each building now these buildings are going to be designed um to be very durable and weather resistant fireproof you name it they're, they're going to build them with the very best of uh, of a, um, of a material, very wow. yeah, and with the best technologies available, and it's going to be made of reinforced concrete, like you know most of these houses anyway. So yes, uh, why well, I've been saying for years, why don't they build build out of concrete? Yeah. Been saying that for years. So it'll be very difficult to ruin these buildings with, say, an earthquake, or a flood, you know, because. They'll be durable, so, you know. Right, and and with regards to the the, the voting idea, it's um, I think they call it rational consensus. Mm. So it, it's like um, it's a bit like like a bunch of doctors would um, so say if you had to have a, a, a medical procedure done, a bunch of doctors would, would talk to you about it, and it, I guess it would work much in the same way, except it wouldn't be. A political leader standing up and kind of giving out lies like they do today. They're, they're not trying to kind of empower themselves. They'll, they'll be trying to put across a case and they'll have to back it up with facts and evidence. Yes, they'll have to use a scientific method this time around. They can't use it based on other things like um, money because in, res in a resource-based economy money will no longer exist. So there'll be little incentive or no incentive at all to right. lie about certain things. Right, exactly. So it, it, whatever case you put forward is going to be based on 
on kind of technical references, basically. Exactly. So, so. and if, if anyone's interested, if anyone doesn't believe you, then they go and they learn because it's free to learn. There's no charge to learn about anything or get educated. So they go to learn about it and they can either challenge you and improve your idea or they can accept it and say, well, okay, it looks like you were right. Let's go ahead and, and get it done. Exactly. That this is, And that's what happens when two people disagree. You, you do experiments, you test, and that's how you find out what works and what doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. So, does that make sense, George? Um, yeah, it's, it certainly makes sense. I mean, there, there's a lot of details that need to be worked out, um, and and it seems like it doesn't just make sense. It seems like it, it's you know we're, we're going to have to go that direction because you know the, the capitalist systems of today, with people just like trying to make as much of as they want for themselves, regardless of the impacts it has on on other people and the ecology and stuff that it's just not sustainable. So, you know, I, I think, I think that system is, you know, the Venus project system is inevitable. Um, I guess the questions become now like that or extinction. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it I hear it that. depends on which way the tight turns, George, because, you know, world war three is also a possibility. If a nuclear war breaks out, then we're finished. We're fucked. There's nothing, you know, anyone. Yeah, pretty stuff. much. I tend to think that um, this this whole resource-based economy, that this Venus Project thing, may actually end up being realized after the majority of the human population is wiped out by climate change or war or something. Because then what that means is that with such a smaller population, it would be easier for that smaller population to agree on a new system than it is trying to have a small minority change the minds of, of the majority, like currently. That's assuming that there will be survivors after this uh, so-called war, but it's not looking good. It's not looking good, because like George Ortega was saying about the whole climate change thing, because the sea level, the, the increasing volume of liquid water, and because of the global floods, the 7% rise of sea levels, the higher acidity of the oceans, and the you know deforestations, the coral reefs, and the plankton being destroyed and stuff, our atmosphere will be in serious trouble because that mean you know for a start there will be less oxygen you know produced in our atmosphere, so we'll have that to worry about. But also, our natural resources will start to diminish. We'll start to lose our crops because of um, you know the changed climate, and that's going to um, cause a lot of social unrest because people will be fighting over resources just to stay alive you know? yeah it, it doesn't sound good I mean that's the thing is mm -hmm. I, I think that I think there will probably be a few survivors of those disasters but hardly any I mean we could go from billions of, of humans to less than 10 humans <laughs> you know what I'm saying yep but who knows maybe we can recover from this maybe we can like accept the Venus project and abandon the old system that's caused so much uh, problems. I mean, it's got to happen one way or the other, George, because well, with, with capitalism, like you said, it's not sustainable because a lot of jobs are going to be take, overtaken with automation. It's already happening now. I mean, in some factories, don't they have like automation in regards to car um, manufacturing cars? Yep. Sure, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, the people. Yeah, people often said they won't take their jobs. I'm like, wait a minute, they already, they already have. They're starting to already. <laughs> yeah. So if automation starts taking over all manual labor, where's the employment going to be? How are people going to have the money to feed themselves? And where's all the money going to come from to feed people who are on social security, George? Yeah. You know, it, it may be that. Um that you know project like the venus project may actually be our best chance of you know best dealing with with climate change so it doesn't become you know just like catastrophic to civilization you know as a whole there is a, a really good documentary called we'll work for free and that basically goes into detail about the um technological unemployment um problem 
and how automation is taking over. It lists a lot of case examples as well. And like Jack Fresco said, I mean, with with automation taking over manual labour, the current economic system is bound to collapse. There's only so long governments can bail out the banks before, you know, things go kaput. You know? Let me ask you, does Fresco deal with happiness? And the reason I ask this is, is I, I've done extensive research on happiness. And like, for example, once people's basic needs are met, you know, meaning that they have like housing, food, clothing, you know, that, that this abundant wealth that, that many countries have beyond that, it's just wasted in terms of happiness because like, you know, uh, beyond, you know, above the poverty level, you know, additional wealth doesn't create much happiness. So my question is, for example, like, as a way of getting us to like stop um, kind of like producing so much, stop having stuff that we don't really need, you know, but like to the extent we produce it, we're like, you know, um, fueling climate change. Do they deal with kind of like that, the issue of like the happier people are, the less they're going to need, the less impact we're going to have on, on the uh, ecology? I think he does talk about um, happiness on some level. He, he once raised the issue about depression and how it ruins people's self-image. Like if someone's depressed, it means it can be many things. Um, say, and it's been observed with animals too. Animals can sometimes feel depression. Like um, if an owner's, if an owner dies, uh, a dog could be laying next to the owner who has passed away, be aware of it, but you know will bark. Like if someone tries to pull um, their owner away from them. I mean, Jet Fresco mentioned that uh, once in one of his videos. And it's, it kind of makes sense because on some level, animals can feel empathy, you know? Well, yeah, but I think, Jamie, it has to go way beyond depression, you know, like lifting depression. Because, like, for example, we are hedonic creatures. We seek pleasure, avoid pain. So if people have the impression that this capitalism that we have now is making them more happy then they're going to be resistant to shifting. Whereas, like, if the Venus Project can come up with a strategy, you know, to make, you know, populations of people much happier, you know, through whatever means, I mean, it could be, like, psychopharmacological, whatever, then that would be, uh, in other words, like, if people are, 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 like, you know, feel happier or evidently happier under this kind of, like, system, let's say in this kind of city, that's going to be a major inducement for other people to want the same thing. Yeah. Well, under capitalism, I mean, like I said before, I mean, people can, they're conditioned to think this way. And a lot of um, this conditioned thinking comes comes from scarcity, doesn't it, uh, David Joseph? Yeah. Yeah, I would say this, the stress of having to kind of, kind of justify your, your existence by earning money would be something that, a lot of people wouldn't mind seeing the back off, to be honest with you. In a system that provided everything for you at no cost, I think, you, you know, you, you're kind of all, already halfway to bliss in, in that kind of a system. Yeah, it's a win-win, you know what I mean? No taxation, but you still have your needs provided for you anyway. Yeah. Right, and, and not just your needs, but a lot of your desires as well, you know? So if, if you want to take up a hobby or, or you know... Uh, study a specific topic or you know you know things will be provided for people who who, who have desires to do things it's exactly I mean they already, they already said that entertainment will still be there and they said that gaming and art and stuff like that it will still be there none of that will change the only thing that would change is that none of this will be involved with money anymore yeah. right so you go from you know, money to kind of like, you know, just available resources. And I mean, like, yeah. you know, because you can translate um, economies to, to resources in a certain sense, you know, to kind of like measure them against each other, whether we have money or not. So the idea is that like, you know, in a lot of countries, you know, it, it takes a certain amount of dollars. And again, that's whether they're distributed among people or whether it's just the, the GT, GDP, gross domestic product, you know, the, 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 um, the sum of the, the um, products made and all, that in a lot of countries, let's say 
people are ha as happy as they are, and it costs, let's say, fifty dollars per I don't know month per person. Whereas another another place it costs, let's say, ten dollars per month per person. And others, so I mean, this is like this is major. I mean, like so much of what we produce, we don't really need. We've 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 been conditioned to want it and need it. But, you know, according to the science, according to the research, we don't really need it. So, again, to the, to the extent that the, um, the Venus Project can focus on, you know, a way to just, like, make people much happier, then, then people will just, like, be much more willing to, to go without, you know, as much, to, 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 to need less. Yeah, and then you can tell the Republicans uh, the advantages um, on their part with the Venus Project. You can say to them, since there's no money involved... They're Republicans, they're not going to listen. Some of them. Um, <laughs> say to them, the advantages of a system will be no taxation, since there's no money in it anymore. So that means, um, it'll, you know, providing people's necessities will be at no cost to them. You know what I mean, David? Yeah, yeah, um... Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think um, the idea is to have like a transitional model. It wouldn't be like a straight case of one day we wake up and we're in a resource-based economy. People would have to be educated and then have to be motivated as well. Um, I've heard Jack Fresco talk about that people may have to experience a lot of suffering before they feel motivated enough to actually look for... Phase, look, yeah. yeah, exactly, to look for a, a solution to their problems. Um, we understand here that there is no free will. And every, everybody needs to be motivated by causal events. So that could include suffering. That could include them seeing examples of living better and living happier. But a lot I mean, I, I don't know. Social, a lot of this will come from not social work. It will come from the uh, economic collapse. You know, that's going to come from automation taking over manual labor once this economic system collapses, people will have to make it they're gonna have to make a decision ah. either choose the venus project and live you know in a virtual paradise or they could choose oblivion like they said by you know violence you know violence is very primitive but people seem to go back to it for some reason i mean i don't know what it is with people who want to fight over things you know yeah, no, I know that's why our work is important. We're changing the, the global psychology, you know, from, from competition to cooperation, from, you know, blaming each other ourselves for everything to kind of like understanding that, hey, we're all, we're all in this together. We're kind of like, you know, we're not, you know, fundamentally to blame, yeah. Yeah, but a lot of this Venus Project um, transition, I mean, if it works, if it ever does succeed, and I'm hoping it does within my lifetime, um... Jack Fresco and Roxanne Meadows and all the people who work for the Venus Project, they're going to ask all the nations to declare Earth common heritage. You know, all the Earth's resources being, belonging to everyone, you know. Oh, absolutely. There's some billionaires who want to own the water. That's insane. Yeah. What's yeah, that? Uh, that doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Earth, you know, Earth is everyone's home, you know. It belongs to no one. I wish people would see that, man. But any suggestions, David? Um, yeah, I think that um, people should also check out the Zeitgeist movement, as well as the Venus Project. Yeah, I saw the first one. It's a good movie. I mean, they get. I mean, they. You know, when they got into like conspiracy theories about 9/11 and stuff, you know, I'm not sure that was necessary. No, you know, no. They got... I, I, I would say that um, the Zeitgeist movies are not the movement. I know it's confusing, but um, oh, okay. the, the guy who the guy who created the the, um, the movies, I think he kind of made a bit of a mistake there because he named the movement after the movies. But um, the Zeitgeist addendum and Zeitgeist moving forward are far more in line with the ideas of the Zeitgeist movement than the first Zeitgeist movie. I would say forget the first Zeitgeist movie. That has nothing to do with the movement whatsoever. Excellent. That's good, yeah. 
yeah, no conspiracy theories. Yeah, I would. Uh, I'm going to check them out because um, you t you told me they like the Venus Project. Um, they're pretty much promoting the same thing, right? It's all supposed to. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, the Zeitgeist movement was actually the activist arm of the Venus Project for yeah. a few years before they had a bit of a split. So, yeah, they, they they basically promote the same thing. Yeah, I heard that um, jo um, Peter Joseph, I think his name was, I heard that he uh, had a falling out with Jeff Fresco. I mean, J Peter Joseph, he, he poured so much of his funds and his time and effort into promoting their movement. And yet, apparently, I'm not gonna, you know, say, I'm not, I'm not gonna claim yes or no. I'm gonna say apparently, Jet Fresco threw it in his face. You know, like they had a falling out, and they just didn't want to know each other after that. You know? yeah, yeah, again, that's like that. yeah. that's where our, you know, I mean, people are gonna disagree, yeah. but that's where our work comes in. Like, who knows? Like, you know, Fresco understands no, if there's no free will. I didn't, you know, I'm not sure how, how well Joseph understands that because, you know, like we, you know, again, like we, we, we reiterate this, that Searle quote that this is the biggest thing, you know, bigger than Einstein, Copernicus, all that stuff. And I, I don't think, because I think I've seen either one or, or both of the, the movies after the first one. And I'm not sure they get into the free will thing. Um, but the idea is like, yeah, even, even like trying to build a, a movement like this, to the extent we can like evolve beyond free will belief, it just makes it so much easier. Right. I um, there was a recent radio show, the uh, Zeitgeist Movement radio show, and they were interviewing people who had just done speeches at the latest um, Zeitgeist Day event, and Peter Joseph was there, and he did mention the whole um, causality thing. He, he oh, acknowledged excellent. it basically. So, yeah, that that's good. That's good. Mm. See, if I know um, Peter Joseph's criticism about Jet Fresco's thing correctly, he said that he didn't explain in enough detail on how um, this um, new economy would come about. Right? Um, yeah. He's done, he's actually done some quite lengthy talks about um, the transitional models and. Uh, uh, possible routes to to changing from uh, a capitalist system to a resource-based economy. I can't remember the name of the talk off the top of my head, but I know he gives one called um, uh, "Just Free Questions." I think it's called a, a video lecture, and that basically kind of outlines uh, the idea of transitioning and why we need to transition, and the goals and the problems that we we have now and how to solve them. Yeah, because the current systems, it's just not working. All it's doing is it's indoctrinating people into being greedy and selfish. You know? Right, so the challenge with this, I think the major challenge is just like the major challenge with climate change. In other words, with climate change, there's a lot of technological issues we're going to have to deal with. We have to like find answers for, but we can't do that until we win this battle against the, the, the 1%. You know, so that, that you know... Because I, mean, uh -huh. I mean, if see, I mean, you know, you guys may be right. Maybe civilization may need to collapse before something like this will happen. But I, you know, hopefully, hopefully we can. We're wise enough um, to to figure out how to like depose the one percent, so we don't have to go from that, you know, that kind of world. Yeah, it's it's going to be very difficult. I. There's only two possibilities that I can see happening, unless some natural disaster comes along and wipes us out, is that either we accept this movement or we go completely the opposite way and destroy ourselves through war or whatever. Well, you, you guys, I mean, like, I just finished an 11 story series on Daily Coast on this climate rescue capitalism idea that, that I've been promoting. and. Something like this might actually be a, a step. It, it's like, in other words, like this, this kind of thing may need to be done in steps. And for example, like the idea behind climate rescue capitalism, like you have, let's say, Hunts and Heinz and these like major, you know, General Foods is these huge corporations, food corporations 
making money for individuals, you know, selling products, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so anytime you go to a supermarket and stuff you need, you know, you're making the rich richer. Whereas like what we could do is just like market our own products to compete with them. And so everybody knows that if we, if they buy our products or, you know, again, like there could be thousands of different companies, but the difference is that instead of the money, the profit going to these rich you know, stockholders and stuff, it would be going to fighting climate change, the political battle, the, the, the scientific battle. And, you know, if, if you guys are familiar with Paul Newman's company, Newman's Own, he's been doing this since 1982, and he's generated $450 million, you know, in this way. So imagine, imagine if, like... Yeah, it's very incredible, man. Oh, God, imagine if, like, thousands of companies were, were doing what he did and you know, with the promotion that that, that would, like, you know, because, like, many people don't even know about Newman's Own. So, right. again, this, this, this could be a way to kind of, like, to... As long as the capitalist system, you know, is here because people feel the need for it, let's divert the products from, you know, the individuals, the rich that it, it now serves to to even causes like the Venus Project. I mean, that... that I think climate change and other more popular understood causes would probably be the way to start. But eventually, yeah, you could have products, you know, when people understand the Venus product, Project, products whose profits go, you know, toward making it happen. Yeah. I mean, there was, um, there was a, a billionaire who gave money to charity, uh, Bill Gates. I mean, he apparently, didn't he give water to, um, he gave fresh water to Africans, didn't he? Yeah, but this is this is different. This, in other words, like, well, how did Bill Gates become a billionaire by selling products, right? Yeah. And he he you know earned he he kept as much of the profit as possible, mm. whereas this would be to compete. Let's say like create a company that competes with Apple, competes with Microsoft, creates an operating system, maybe even Linux. You know, start charging, make Linux much more stable, or whatever. You know, and like when people buy Linux, maybe it'll be much less expensive than than uh, Windows or or the iOS systems, and and but the profit is going toward you know um, toward let's say you know less expensive computers for everybody or computers for you know cell phones for the the very poor stuff like that. You know, the idea is like to, to re redirect that that money that comes from the profits the products we buy away from the rich. And toward where it's needed, toward you know, toward, it's it's kind of like a resource-based economy, based on on our shopping um, habits. Yeah, I, I like that idea. But yeah. um, with, with money, there's always a problem that that people are going to kind of. Um... I was going to say, um, with uh, money, um, there's always going to be a problem of uh, people getting inferior products. Uh, but under the Venus project, everyone kind of is the same. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you got to create products that are equal, at least equal in price and value. You know, to the existing products. Yeah. They got to be competitive. Yeah, they got to be competitive. But when you when you're talking about giving um, a cheaper product to the poor, you have you have to be careful on making sure they're getting um, you know reliability and all that stuff. You know. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Dave, David Jobs, Joseph, what you were gonna say? Uh, I just got cut off, so I, I don't I don't know what was said just now. Sorry. I repeat what you said from the beginning. Oh yeah, I was just um, saying about that. Um, sometimes money can kind of corrupt people. So at some point, you might get someone trying to to skim off the top, or you know, they they might try to deviate. Oh wait, shortcuts. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Right. And David, actually, yeah, we have a model for this with not-for-profits. Ordinarily, with not-for-profit organizations, you know, it's accepted that like 20% of their revenue they can use for operating expenses, you know, like salaries and stuff. So yeah, for example, if four people like um, own a business like this and they're donating all their profits to charity, let's say they donate one million dollars to charity in a year, right? So it's four people that run it, you know. So let's say each of them get fifty thousand dollars. Um, which is like um, 20%, 200,000, you know, um, being 20% of 1 million. Then, but if, if they if they make, if they give away 2 million, and all of a sudden their salary increases to, to 100,000. Now, you know, the, the idea behind this is that like, 
while while it's the goal to kind of like move from this kind of like personal gain model to like kind of like the resource based model we have to acknowledge the reality we're living in in other words like if we want people who are still in this mindset to work on this then you know it's better than they're giving away let's say 80% of the pro- profits than that they were giving away no percent you know it's right. kind of like this yeah 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 i i completely agree yeah i think the uh, the non-profit idea was um is is a good idea definitely definitely yeah of course it's a good idea all i'm saying is that the venus project um they have a better solution to everything that we've ever thought of because everyone will kind of get the same in regards to technology or you know necessities you know no one no one has a reason to be jealous because there won't be a scarcity of resources they'll have like automation produce abundance of whatever people need and to a certain extent want yeah. Guys, have we have we explored this enough? Do, should we go to the uh, the the God thing or? Um, I I guess so. I haven't known much too much what to say about all this all this stuff with the Venus Project and the Climate Rescue Capitalism. But I think they're great ideas, and I it's it's very fun listening and talking about it. I don't, I don't know. Perhaps yeah, we we could do a we could do a short podcast on on the God thing if you want. I'm a little bit tired, but. Um, well, Chandler, no, I mean, it's a weekend. We can we can save this for next, you know, because it is a holiday weekend, so. Yeah, yeah, because I would like the idea of saving it for next weekend so we can go a little bit longer because I have to get to bed by 8. So, um, I, yeah, I don't like us to be time constricted. So, um, yeah, so should I end this episode? You yeah, guys, have, have we covered this enough or what do you think? I, I think we have for now, yeah. Yeah, because we can keep coming back to this, absolutely. All right. You've been listening to Free Will, Science, and Religion, and the guys have been talking about a resource-based economy as proposed by the Venus Project, and also climate rescue capitalism, and all these solutions to, you know, help the world towards a more sustainable and happier system than the one we've been living under. So, hope you learned something, and I'm sure we'll revisit all these topics in the future. Thank you for listening, and goodbye.